Thank you for joining us for the Food Loss and Waste podcast. This episode will explore partner solutions to reduce food loss and waste, reducing post-harvest losses. This podcast is hosted by the USAID Research of Community and Practice Working Group on Food Loss and Waste, and will feature interviews with subject matter experts to explore the implications of and approaches to addressing food loss and waste. My name is Nika Larian, and I'm a AAAS Fellow in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security Center for Nutrition and the co-chair of the Food Loss and Waste Working Group. Today, I will be speaking with Jagger Harvey from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for the Reduction of Post-Harvest Loss. Welcome, Jagger. Please introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Nika, and thanks to all the listeners. I'm Jagger Harvey, a research professor here at Kansas State University. I was born in Haiti and grew up in rural Haiti and Washington State here in the U.S. And seeing the challenges that my farming uh, friends faced and their families faced in the food system, it really compelled me to develop a career in agricultural development. And leading an innovation lab has been really a privilege and an honor to help me work with partners around the world and leverage the capacities and expertise here in the land grant and broader research system in the U.S. to address some of the most critical challenges to food and nutritional security today. Thank you so much for that introduction and also sharing some of your background. It's so important to, to learn how we all became so interested in joining this field. So now we'll, we'll delve into the first question, which is, can you discuss some of the major advancements made to address food loss and waste under the Innovation Lab? And which innovations are you most excited about? Thank you. So the Post-Harvest Loss Innovation Lab has been running since the beginning of 2014. So we have the advantage of having gone for almost nine years now. What we've been able to do is work with local partners, establish in-country human and institutional capacity, including research laboratories, generate evidence to inform policy, and really start to deploy things at scale. Um, Post-harvest losses are covered under the Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 as the others are, it's very ambitious to have food loss and waste by 2030, which is right around the corner. One third of the food that's produced globally is still lost or wasted, which translate to a trillion dollars of food every year, or enough to feed 2 billion people, according to FAO. As a country, food loss and waste falls only behind China in the U and the U.S. for associated greenhouse gas emissions with 10% of anthropogenic greenhouse gases coming from food loss and waste. Post-harvest losses of grains in Sub-Saharan Africa are estimated to exceed the value of all U.S. global food assistance combined. But post-harvest losses are driven by poor drying and storage, things that we know how to solve in a variety of contexts. The issues include quantity losses, such as insect pests eating the food that we produce instead of people, pesticide, poisoning from improper application, fungi in the environment, uh, contaminating our food with toxins that can cause cancer and are associated with stunting children's development uh, and new negative birth outcomes, and other quality and safety loss, loss issues that erode advances in improving nutrition. But again, post-harvest loss issues are readily addressable with targeted research for development efforts that empower local partners as champions across the food system. Our pro program has worked in eight countries to empower our in-country partners as champions of food system change to reduce post-harvest -har loss issues. Some of the um, interventions that we're most excited about in Bangladesh, Bangladesh Agricultural University took a product lifecycle approach to work with stakeholders, define a target product profile, and develop the BAU STR dryer. It's now been piloted into use and it's accepted in the official government of Bangladesh's agricultural mechanization subsidy program to subsidize up to 5,000 dryers to be deployed for use by smallholder farmers across Bangladesh in the next several years. Another that we're very excited about is the GrainMate moisture meter. It was originally developed by Paul Armstrong at USDA ARS and pick, picked up by young, a young Isaac Sessi as a, a student at KNUST University in Ghana. For his work on the grain mate, Isaac was later awarded one of the top 35 innovators under the age of 35 by MIT 
And he's now scaled about a thousand grain mates uh, from across Ghana and beyond. A third innovation we're really proud of, we partnered with Vestergaard Franson, a private sector company, uh, to validate zero fly hermetic bags. These are next generation hermetic bags with slow release safe insecticide, which protects from insides both in, insects both within the bags and outside. And these innovations are underpinning what we're scaling out to have inclusive benefits to reduce post-harvest loss issues, to improve food and nutritional security at scale in Ghana, Bangladesh, and beyond. Thank you for sharing those exciting innovations and, and how you're working to empower local partners to tackle that ambitious SDG 12.3. What have you seen in your work in the field that you think will help improve food security the most? So really it's about localization with the partners in country. Um, if we were to come up with the solutions sitting here in our offices and labs in the US without consulting our in-country partners as leads and ultimate champions to carry these forward, we're almost certainly doomed to fail. We've seen so much funding and efforts wasted and squandered around the world with that type of an approach. And it's one of the things I really admire about Feed the Future, about the global food security strategy, the global food security research strategy, and how we create with our colleagues at USAID in our cooperative agreement to come up with these types of solutions. I'll also say that the involvement of the missions is really critical. So the way that we work as a program and many other innovation labs is we identify first the leaders in country that we need to work with in research and along the product life cycle. And then we look at the expertise that we need to add from the US or other international sides to complement rather than compete with what is going on there. One example of that um, is our work in Ghana we worked with the Women in Poultry Association, um, and they were confronting a lot of post-harvest issues that they really didn't know how much they were losing in terms of feed and the, the negative impact on productivity of their poultry. Working with them to um, co-develop and really understand which innovations we need to deploy with them, one farmer, Josephine Yabua, went from having a thousand poultry to 50,000 poultry within three years of working with us and the USDA funded Amplifies project previously. And so we can't claim complete attribution for that growth, but we, we do claim a substantial part of that because the feed is much better stored and it doesn't suffer from a lot of quantity and quality issues. The poultry produce a lot more eggs. They have a much longer period where they can lay those eggs and there's much lower mortality. So in the, at the end of the day, what that allows us to do is work with these uh, private sector uh, female leaders in the communities, get a foothold for adoption of technologies with people in the meso scale who can afford to adopt them. And now we're moving on from there to work with smallholder farmers in the North so getting that foothold so that we can scale things with the appropriate actors in country who do have some resources to adopt, it can catapult us to have the kind of food security impacts we need, including with the most vulnerable farmers as well. Well, those are some pretty remarkable results. Thank you for sharing those. And as you noted, buy-in from stakeholders in country is, is so key to ensuring that these innovations are, are implemented at scale. So my last question for you today is, what research gaps remain to achieving impact at scale? Thanks again, Nika. Uh, that's a great question. And our work is never done, unfortunately, in food security, um, but we continue making great strides. And, and really, I see the next frontier that we've all been moving towards is bringing, some, bringing things together in more of a food systems approach, bringing the actors across the food system together. So, Building on the last example, we've now helped transform the Women in Poultry Association's poultry operations. The, they then started uh, facing an epic climate-related feed shortage, and they've had to reduce the size of their flocks. We looked north in the zone of influence in Ghana, and we connected with the Value Chain Commission and Women and Men's Smallholder Farming Cooperatives. Now, these smallholder farmer groups gave their basically gave their maize away at giveaway prices at harvest and then bought back at higher prices, as we've seen all across Feed the Future. 
So what we did is we linked the Women and Poultry Association facing feed shortages with smallholder farmer groups in the north. And these women and men in the north, we're backstopping them to have uh, good drying and storage practices. The Women and Poultry Association pay those women premiums for their maize. They also pay them partly in eggs, so those families have more nutritious diets as well. And it's been a win-win across that food system. We're building on that right now and supporting SESI technologies in the shadow of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the unfolding food insecurity crisis to set up food security rescue teams. These are resilience cultivating envoys. And working with SESI, we're providing them with zero fly hermetic bags. They're producing the grain mate moisture meters. We're equipping them with extension materials. And they're headed north with enough bags to secure over 5,000 tons of maize in this food security crisis. This translates to about 1,000 tons of CO2 waste that's being averted, but this is just the beginning. In Ghana, we found that 30% of maize is lost to post-harvest loss issues, of which 87% is readily preventable through the kind of drying and storage that we're doing. This translates to over half a million tons of CO2 that is released into the atmosphere from preventable post-harvest loss agricultural activities. So by bringing the different parts of the food system together, by challenging ourselves, working with in-country partners in the face of this food insecurity crisis, we see a lot of hope to really transform the way we're doing business, ensure that we bolster resilience and have a much brighter uh, future. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up a food systems approach. Of course, that's very near and dear to us in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I wanna thank you so much, Jagger, for joining us today and sharing really concrete examples of what a USAID implementing partner is doing on the ground to address food loss of waste. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us today. Thank you, Nika, it's been my pleasure.